Between 1898 and 1902, the Irish playwright John Millington Singh spent several summers on the Aran Islands. Shaped by the harsh environment of the North Atlantic Ocean, the islanders lived in a unique society. Old customs and traditions that had died out in many parts of Ireland still survived at the turn of the 20th century. Singh has left us a mesmerising account of life on the Aran Islands and we will spend the next 30 minutes on these islands in the summer of 1901 listening to descriptions of a society that for many of us is hard to believe still existed into the early 20th century. Singh captured a time and place that is now lost and gone forever but in the course of this podcast we'll get a snapshot of that remarkable society. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is The Iron Islands in 1901, Voices from a Vanishing World. It's strange times, folks, and I hope you, your friends and your family are safe in the face of the COVID-19 crisis. Increasingly, lots of us have to spend time apart and I hope some of these podcasts are helping in some way to get you through that. If you're looking for a new show, I'd really recommend a new podcast called The Nutty Chronicles, It's created by Martin Nutty and it's a history of his family. Now what makes it really amazing for me is that Martin's family, as he says himself, are not famous, but are instead quite ordinary like your family or mine. However, Martin has a great storytelling format and a personal style to the show, which makes it really great. So I'd really recommend checking out the Nutty Chronicles. Now let's head to the Iron Islands in the summer of 1901. The words of John by Aidan Crow. I am sitting over a turf fire, listening to a murmur of Gaelic that is rising from a little public house under my room. The steamer, which comes to Arran, sails according to the tide. It was six o'clock this morning when we left the quay of Galway in a dense shroud of mist. A low line of shore was visible at first on the right, between the movement of the waves and the fog. But when we came further, it was lost sight of, and nothing could be seen but the mist curling in the rigging and a small circle of foam. There were few passengers. A couple of men going out with young pigs tied loosely in sacking, three or four young girls who sat in the cabin with their heads completely twisted in their shawls, and a builder, on his way to repair the pier at Kilronan, who walked up and down and talked with me. In about three hours, Aaron came into sight. A dreary rock appeared at first, sloping up from the sea into the fog. Then, as we drew nearer, a coast guard station and the village. We find ourselves on the Iron Islands at the turn of the 20th century and just like the Dublin writer John Millington Singh, who we've just heard from, we are definitely somewhat out of place. While the journey out to the islands has familiarised us with the smell of the sea and the sound of gulls, the islands have a distinctly unique and different feel to them. Located 10 miles off the west coast of County Galway, there's a tangible difference between the Iron Islands and the mainland. The population of the islands stands at just over 2,800 people and has been in decline since the famine. That said, by the turn of the 20th century, there are increasing numbers of tourists here. Many of them are like John Millington Singh and are language enthusiasts, drawn here to learn Irish. What Singh describes as the murmur of Gaelic is all around us. However, the islanders are well able to speak English. In 1901, only 565 islanders spoke only Irish and these tend to be an older generation or a younger cohort who will learn English in the coming years. The island itself is a harsh environment. John Millington Singh is the son of a wealthy Dublin lawyer and he is clearly taken aback by his surroundings. I was wandering out along the one good roadway of the island, looking over low walls on either side into small flat fields of naked rock. I have seen nothing so desolate. Grey floods of water were sweeping everywhere upon the limestone, making at times a wild torrent of the road, which twined continually over low hills and cavities in the rock, or passed between a few small fields of potatoes or grass hidden away in corners that had shelter. Whenever the cloud lifted, I could see the edge of the sea below me, on the right, and the naked ridge of the island above me, on the other side. While this landscape clearly enthralls Singh, it's the people here on the island that grab our attention. In their appearance, they are very different to either the rich or poor you would find in a city like Dublin in 1901. The islanders make most of their clothes themselves 
and the very concept of fashion as it exists in Dublin at the time does not exist here. Singh now described the islanders around us. The women wear red petticoats and jackets of island wool, stained with madder, to which they usually add a plaid shawl twisted around their chests and tied at their back. When it rains, they throw another petticoat over their heads, with the waistband around their faces. Or, if they are young, they use a heavy shawl, like those worn in Galway. Occasionally, other wraps are worn, and during the thunderstorm I arrived in, I saw several girls with men's waistcoats buttoned around their bodies. Their skirts do not come much below the knee, and show their powerful legs in heavy indigo stockings, which they are all provided. The men wear three colours, the natural wool, indigo and grey flannel that is woven of alternate threads of indigo and the natural wool. In Aranmore, many of the younger men have adopted the usual fisherman's jersey, but on Inishman, have only seen one on this island. As flannel is cheap, the women spin the yarn from the wool of their own sheep, and it is then woven by a weaver in Kilronan for fourpence a yard. The men seem to wear an indefinite number of waistcoats, and woolen drawers one over the other. They are usually surprised at the lightness of my own dress, and one old man I spoke to for a minute on the pier when I came ashore asked me if I was not cold with my little clothes. The most famous item of clothing are what people call pampooties, sandals worn by the islanders. While this footwear seems crude, almost a sign that island life is stuck in the past, this is not the case at all. Indeed, the more time we spend on the island and our shoes start to fall apart from walking over sharp rocks, we see how ingenious these pampooties are. Singh now explains what exactly these sandals look like. Michael walks so fast when I am out with him, I cannot pick up my steps, and the sharp edge fossils which abound in the limestone have cut my shoes to pieces. In the end it was decided to make me a pair of pampooties. Now, they consist simply of a piece of raw cowskin, with the hair outside, laced over the toe and round the heel with two ends of fishing line, that work round and are tied above the instep. In the evening, when they are taken off, they are placed in a basin of water, as the rough hide cuts the foot and stocking if it is allowed to harden. For the same reason, people often step into the surf during the day, so that their feet are continually moist. At first I threw my weight upon my heels, as one naturally does in a boot, and it was a good deal bruised. But after a few hours, I learned the natural walk of man, and I could follow my guide in any portion of the island. In one district below the cliffs, towards the north, one goes for nearly a mile, jumping from one rock to another without a single ordinary step. And here I realised that toes have a natural use, for I found myself jumping towards any tiny crevice in the rock before me, and clinging with an eager grip in which all the muscles of my feet ached from their exertion. The more time one spends around the islanders, it's clear that spirituality plays a very important role in day-to-day -day life here at the turn of the 20th century. In 1901, 95% of those living on the island are Catholic. There is a community of 32 Scots fishermen who have come to the island for work, and they are Protestants of varying denominations. There's also 28 English people who by and large are associated with the Coast Guard Station who are also Protestants. However, the Catholicism practised here on the islands is strange. As is common in some of the most remote parts of Ireland, the islanders have melded their Catholic beliefs with older pre-Christian ideas of the supernatural. In the evenings, as is common, we spend time sitting around fires where these beliefs of the islanders come out in their stories. Singh has this experience. As we talked, he sat huddled together over the fire. His face was indescribably pliant, lighting up with an ecstasy of humour when he told me anything that had a point of wit or malice, and growing sombre and desolate again when he spoke of religion or the fairies. He told me how one of his children had been taken by the fairies. One day, a neighbour was passing and she said, when she saw it on the road, that's a fine child. Its mother tried to say God bless it, but something choked the words in her throat. A while later they found a wound on its neck, and for three nights the house was filled with noises. I never wear a shirt at night, he said, but I got up out of my bed, all naked as I was, when I heard the noises in the house, and lighted a light, but there was nothing in it. Then a dummy came, and made signs of hammering nails in a coffin. The next day the seed potatoes were full of blood, and the child told its mother that he was going to America. That night it died. And believe me, said the old man, the fairies were in it. While a belief in the fairies sounds strange, almost childlike, here on the Iron Islands it's far more complex. 
The fairies are not a source of amusement. They are widely believed in, in the way Christians believe in the saints. But fairies are potentially a very dangerous force not to be toyed with. The story Singh heard is perplexing. What exactly the man is talking about is unclear, but the fairies in communities like this one here on the Iron Islands are often used to explain sudden or unexplained illnesses, be they physical or mental. People often thought the sick person was a changeling. Essentially, the fairies had taken away the real person and left an ill or distressed person in their place. For the islanders, their belief in the fairies obviously jars with their Catholicism, and one islander explains this to Singh. On our way home, he gave me the Catholic theory of the fairies. When Lucifer saw himself in the glass, he thought himself equal with God. Then the Lord threw him out of heaven, and all the angels that belonged to him. While he was chucking them out, an archangel asked him to spare some of them, and those that were falling are in the air still, and have the power to wreck ships and to work evil in the world. The isolation of island life also preserves traditional customs which have been eradicated by the Catholic Church in other parts of Ireland. An old woman has died while we're here and the islanders bury her in accordance with older customs which have been dying out in other areas in the final decades of the 19th century. After Mass this morning, an old woman was buried. She lived in the cottage next mine and more than once before noon I heard a faint echo of the keen. I did not go to the wake for fear my presence might jar upon the mourners. But all last evening I could hear the strokes of a hammer in the yard, where in the middle of a little crowd of idlers, the next of kin laboured slowly at the coffin. Today, before the hour of the funeral, putching was served to a number of men who stood upon the road, and a portion was brought to me in my room. Then the coffin was carried out, sewn loosely in sailcloth, and held near the ground by three cross poles lashed upon the top. As we moved down to the lower eastern portion of the island, nearly all the men and all the oldest women, wearing petticoats over their heads, came out and joined the procession. While all these new sights and sounds are hard to take in, the most striking difference between life here on the Iron Islands and in cities like Dublin is how islanders tell the time. In Dublin at the turn of the 20th century, life is regulated by clocks. The factory workers and dockers have to go to work at a certain time. The offices and shops open and close at a certain time. However, here on the Iron Islands in 1901, there are no clocks and the people break up their day in a different way. Time itself is different here. As always, Singh captures this best. He spent time on Inishman, the middle island of the chain of three that makes up the Iron Islands, and he has this great story about how people in the cottage where he was staying understand time. The general knowledge of time on the island depends curiously enough, on the direction of the wind. Nearly all of the cottages are built, like this one, with two doors opposite each other, the more sheltered of which lies open all day to give light to the interior. If the wind is northerly, the south door is opened, and the shadow of the doorpost moving across the kitchen floor indicates the hour. As soon, however, as the wind changes to the south, the other door is opened, and the people who never think of putting up a primitive dial are at a loss. Now this created major problems, one that any visitor to the island has to get used to. When the wind blows from the north and the south facing door in the house is opened, things are okay because people can see what time it is from the shadow cast by the sun. However, if the wind changes direction and the south facing door is closed, time becomes more about perception and this is a bit of an issue when it comes to meal times. When the wind is from the north, the old woman manages my meals with fair regularity. But on the other days, she often makes my tea at three o'clock instead of six. If I refuse it, she puts it down to simmer for three hours in the turf, and then brings it in at six o'clock full of anxiety to know if it is warm enough. The general ignorance of any precise hours in the day makes it impossible for people to have regular meals. They seem to eat together in the evening, and sometimes in the morning a little after dawn, before they scatter for their work. But during the day, they simply drink a cup of tea and eat a piece of bread or some potatoes whenever they are hungry. For men who live in the open air, they eat strangely little. Often when Michael has been out weeding potatoes for eight or nine hours without food, he comes in and eats a few slices of homemade bread, and then he is ready to go out with me and wander for hours about the island. The islanders conceive time in a very different way. While I am walking with Michael, someone often comes up to me to ask the time of day. A few of the people, however, are sufficiently used to modern time to understand in more than a vague way the convention of the hours. 
and when I tell them what o'clock it is by my watch, they are not satisfied, and ask how long is left then before the twilight. All this basically means that nothing on the island can happen at a specific time of the day. A branch of the Gaelic League has been started here since my last visit, and every Sunday afternoon three little girls walk through the village ringing a shrill handbell as a signal that the women's meeting is to be held. Here it would be useless to fix an hour, as the hours are not recognised. These aspects of island life lead some to view the islanders as a very simple folk who live in an almost mythical island unadulterated by the modern world which has transformed Dublin by 1901. Singh frequently uses the term primitive to describe the islanders and their way of life. This is misrepresentative. It is in fact an economically poor island where isolation has preserved older customs. However, life on the islands is changing by the year 1901. The Congested Districts Board, an agency designed to help the most impoverished parts of Ireland, has begun to modernise aspects of island life. The community of Scots fishermen living here are employed to develop and modernise the fishing industry. Naturally, this is having an impact, one that was obvious even to outsiders like Singh. Furthermore, any notion that Ireland life was idyllic or harmonious is undermined by what we are about to see next. While evictions were common across Ireland in the 19th and early 20th centuries, the Arran Islands is not where we might expect to see one. Traditionally, landlords seized cattle and sheep belonging to tenants in arrears. But here, on the islands, it's only the islanders themselves who know who owns which animals. This made seizing animals to pay rent arrears much more difficult. However, by 1901, this too is changing. Two recent attempts to carry out evictions on the island came to nothing. For each time a sudden storm rose, by, it is said, the power of a native witch, when the steamer was approaching and it made it impossible to land. This morning, however, broke beneath a clear sky of June, and when I came into the open air, the sea, the rocks, were shining with wonderful brilliancy. Groups of men dressed in their holiday clothes were standing about, talking with anger and fear, yet showing a lurking satisfaction at the thought of the dramatic pageant that was to break the silence of the seas. About half past nine, the steamer came in sight, on the narrow line of the sea horizon that is seen in the centre of the bay. And immediately a last effort was made to hide cows and sheep of the families that were most in debt. Till this year, no one on the island would consent to act as bailiff, so that it was impossible to identify the cattle of the defaulters. Now, however, a man of the name of Patrick has sold his honour, and the effort con of concealment is practically futile. This falling away from the ancient loyalty of the island has caused intense indignation. And earlier yesterday morning, while I was dreaming on the dune, this letter was nailed to the doorpost of the chapel. Patrick, the devil, a revolver is waiting for you. If you are missed with the first shot, there will be five more that will hit you. Any man that will talk to you, or work with you, or drink a pint of porter in your shop, will be done with the same way as yourself. This man Patrick is now hated by his community. He is considered a traitor, even by his own mother. Singh explains the unfolding scene. An old woman came forward from the crowd, and, mounting on a rock near the slip, began a fierce rhapsody in Gaelic, pointing at the bailiff and waving her withered arms with extraordinary rage. This man is my own son, she said. It is I that ought to know him. He is the first ruffian in the whole big world. And then she gave an account of his life, coloured with a vindictive fury I cannot reproduce. As she went on, the excitement became so intense, I thought that the man would be stoned before he could get back to his cottage. On these islands, the women live only for their children. And it is hard to estimate the power of the impulse that made this old woman stand out and curse her son. In the fury of her speech, I seem to look again into the strangely reticent temperament of the islanders and to feel the passionate spirit that expresses itself at odd moments only with magnificent words and gestures. These events are accompanied by an eviction evocatively captured by Singh. A stop was made at one of the first cottages in the village and the day's work had begun. Here, however, at the next cottage, a compromise was made as some relatives came up at the last moment and lent the money that was needed to gain a respite. In another case, a girl was ill in the house, so the doctor interposed, and the people were allowed to remain after a merely formal eviction. About midday, however, a house was reached 
where there was no pretext for mercy, and no money could be procured. At a sign from the sheriff, the work of carrying out the beds and utensils was begun in the middle of a crowd of natives who looked on in absolute silence, broken only by the wild imprecations of a woman in the house. She belonged to one of the most primitive families on the island, and she shook with uncontrollable fury as she saw the strange armed men who spoke a language she could not understand driving her from the hearth she had brooded on for thirty years. For these people, the outrage to the hearth is the supreme catastrophe. They live here in a world of grey where there are wild rains and mists every week of the year, and their warm chimney corners filled with children and young girls grow into the consciousness of each family in a way it is not easy to understand in more civilised places. The outrage to a tomb in China probably gives no greater shock to the Chinese than the outrage to a hearth in Inish man gives to the people. When the few trifles had been carried out and the door was blocked up with stones, the old woman sat down by the threshold and covered her head with her shawl. While the eviction breaks the idea that island life is harmonious or idyllic, a more complex picture of the islanders emerges over time. Emigration is a constant feature of life here, and in 1901, the islanders are very aware of the wider world and always curious for news. A few of the men have curiously full vocabulary. Others only know the commonest words in English and are driven to ingenious devices to express their meaning. Of all the subjects we can talk of, war seems to be their favourite and the conflict between America and Spain is causing a great deal of excitement. Nearly all the families have relations who have had to cross the Atlantic, and all eat of the flour and bacon that is brought from the United States. So they have a vague fear that, if anything happened to America, their own island would cease to be habitable. Foreign languages are another favourite topic, and as these men are bilingual, they have a fair notion of what it means to speak and think in many different idioms. They sometimes ask me the French for simple phrases, and when they have listened to the intonation for a moment, most of them are able to reproduce it with admirable precision. While island life in itself was enthralling, for John Millington Singh it would inspire some of his most famous work. On the island he intently listened to the stories the islanders told him, like this one. He often tells me about a Connacht man who killed his father with the blow of a spade when he was in a passion and then fled to this island and threw himself on the mercy of some of the natives with whom he is said to be related. They hid him in a hole, which the old man has shown me, and kept him safe for weeks, though the police came and searched for him, and he could hear their boots grinding on the stones over his head. In spite of a reward which was offered, the island was incorruptible, and after much trouble the man was safely shipped to America. This impulse to protect the criminal is universal in the West. It seems partly due to the association between justice and the hated English jurisdiction, but more directly to the primitive feeling of these people, who are never criminals yet always capable of crime, that a man will not do wrong unless he is under the influence of a passion, which is as irresponsible as a storm on the sea. If a man has killed his father and is already sick and broken with remorse, they can see no reason why he should be dragged away and killed by the law. This would prove to be the basis of his most famous work, The Playboy of the Western World. In this play, the central character is a man called Christy Mahan, who supposedly murdered his father and seeks protection in a rural community in the west of Ireland. In 1907, The Playboy of the Western World was performed in the Abbey Theatre for the first time. It would become Singh's most famous play, not least because it provoked riots. That same year of 1907, Singh published a book called The Iron Islands in Connemara, which recorded his experiences there. As he reflected back on the islands, he finished with this wonderful paragraph that encapsulated a remarkable place. I have come out of an hotel full of tourists and commercial travellers to stroll along the edge of Galway Bay and look out in the direction of the islands. The sort of yearning I feel towards those lonely rocks is indescribably acute. This town, that is usually so full of wild human interest, seems in my present mood a tawdry medley of all that is crudest in modern life. The nullity of the rich and the squalor of the poor give me the same pang of wandering disgust, yet the islands are fading already, and I can hardly realise that the smell of seaweed and the drone of the Atlantic are still moving around them. I'd like to thank Aidan Crow for his narrations. If you want to read more from Singh's work on the Iron Islands, there are links included in the episode guide to the complete text. 
I'll be back next week with a new show. In the meantime, my bonus podcast series on medieval life continues over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Until next time, Sloan. <laughs>